Banned from our Star Trek, this is still Plays Galaxy of Heroes, and this is a talk video. We're back with the Seer Junda kit reveal. Going over our usual stuff, the developer insights, breakdown and analysis of the kit. We're going to tack on the gear review for Cal Kestis now that he is live in-game, and then we will wrap up with the free-to-play gearing of my roster. With Seer Junda, we're getting a light side support scoundrel unaligned force user who is a leader. Unfortunately, CG decided to rush this out, missing the standard animations or graphics, so we'll make do with other visual visuals. I don't really know what the rush was. Apparently, she's going to be coming out in two weeks, and we already knew she was coming. They could have let this breathe for a little bit. Big thing here is that they emphasize how she needs zero speed. They do it twice in two separate bullets. So I hope you have held on to a couple mods without speed secondaries. For those of you who have sliced bad 5-dot mods into 6-dot mods, you might have a character that you can place some of those on as you replace them. I've been preparing for this day by shoving some of the mods with good secondary percentages that don't have speed onto bad characters in case we got a good option for a non-speed prioritized squad. Hopefully it turns out to be the right sets. I think what I have is mostly defensive based, but maybe we can place some on Seer Juno until I find some better ones. In the strategy tips portion, they emphasize that Seer does particularly well with characters who do multiple instances of damage, Fulcrum and Scavray being the two who fit right now. And in the questions portion, the part here that I want to emphasize is they specifically compare Seer's second special determined assault to Rex's aerial advantage. So keep that ability in mind for the degree of damage that we're potentially looking at here. When it comes to the kit reveal, sometimes we do these a little out of order, and in Seer Junda's case, we are going to begin with the leadership, then go to the unique, then handle the basic and the specials because of the downstream effects that are going to be coming out of this. It will help us understand what is going on with the basic and the specials by breaking these down first. The leadership ability, Rekindle, this is a Zeta and an Omicron ability, and with Seer we have a Grand Arena Omicron, and it is excellent. The ability, without the Omicron, all allies have plus 20% defense, max health, max protection that's doubled for unaligned force users at the start of each encounter all unaligned force users and jedi allies gain protection up and tenacity up for two turns if all allies are unaligned and there are no gls until an ally takes their first turn whenever an enemy starts their turn all unaligned allies gain 5% crit chance, crit damage, offense, stacking until the end of battle. While the allies have accuracy up, they have plus 50 crit damage, and all other unaligned allies gain 5% turn meter whenever another unaligned ally takes damage. Before we even get to the Omicron ability, this is an excellent leadership that has a stat boost for survivability and mechanics to drive up the damage output and manipulate turn meter. With all new marquees, I am looking for these stat boosts because it is one of the big methods CG uses to make old characters relevant for the current game. The other big method being stat sharing. The TM is written in a way so that Seer herself won't gain turn meter and pay attention to that accuracy up crit damage mechanic for a little bit later. With the Grand Arena Omicron, if all allies are unaligned and non-GL, allies gain 30% max health and max protection and are immune to ability block and daze. So we get an increased performance from that stat boost that we saw without the Omicron, and in addition to it, we get the immunity to block and daze, which means they're going to be a lot harder to control. At the start, of each encounter, all unaligned and Jedi allies gain 75% protection up instead, and for each instance of damage any unaligned ally deals to an enemy, they gain 10% 
offense stacking. So a couple things here. One, the Jedi ally call out potentially means Cal Kestis, Jedi survivor Kestis, might go to this squad after we unlock him. And the second portion here with for each instance of damage, that's the portion here that is referring to Fulcrum and Ray that they were highlighting in the insights and strategy tips portion because Scav Ray can do multiple inst instances of damage when she has buffs or foresight, and Fulcrum does additional instances of damage for each buff that she has, has when she does the Whirlwind ability. Everyone on this squad is going to gain additional offense as they do damage, but Fulcrum and Scav Ray will do it at an accelerated rate, particularly Fulcrum, which is going to basically cement them on this squad. Now, we, we're gonna get additional characters Maybe we'll have a future version out in a while, but it's going to take a few additional characters. Marin will most likely be unaligned as well. So we see the makings of a squad here, but there's the final portion here. Until an ally takes their first turn, whenever an enemy starts their turn, all unaligned gain an additional 10% crit chance, crit damage, offense stacking until the end of battle. And this is a huge portion of why you're going to want everyone slow on this squad. That means Scavery is getting slow mods, Fulcrum is getting slow mods down the line because you want ev the opponent to take as many turns as possible. It also means you probably want to go up against even faster squads. Maybe not troopers because of other mechanics, but that type of thinking where the faster these squads get, the more dangerous this squad can potentially be. And whenever an ally cleanses, they're going to recover 15% health and protection and gain foresight at the end of their turn. So on top of all of the stat boosts, the turn meter mechanics, the offensive stacking, we're also going to get an additional survivability mechanic in healing from the Omicron that we don't have in the leadership on its own. This Omicron is one of the biggest no-brainers there could be. This is going to work at low stars, low gear, it doesn't matter. I would not waste much time putting it on. I'm going to waste a little time because I'm going to want to show you guys before and after and I'm going to want to do things at lower gear before I take them up to relics. But this portion here is why Fulcrum and Scavray are going to be a part of the squad. And without the Omicron, you lose some of the synergies that are going to make Fulcrum and Scavray standouts. With her unique ability, Unity Through Adversity, at the start of the battle, Seer gains 20% tenacity for each dark side unaligned ally. 20% max protection for each other light side unaligned ally and 20% defense for each Jedi ally. So here we're getting the makings of a very diverse squad. We could see potentially Marin is here, Asajj could join her. We can see how Jedi survivor Cal could have a home here. This could be the end game intent for this squad where we get Fulcrum, Kelkestis, Seer, Marin, Jedi Survivor. But you can see somebody like Scavray would be falling out of the squad in that instance. Or maybe we start seeing this be more of a makeshift home after the fact that's a lower tier squad. So it could go in either direction. It's either going to be an upper tier squad or maybe more that Sana Staros kind of level squad that's taking on some stragglers. With the second portion, if all allies are unaligned and there are no GLs, at the end of each of her turns, Seer's cooldowns are increased by one. Whenever an enemy takes a turn, her cooldowns are decreased by one. So the cooldown mechanics here, along with the leadership ability, are really why you're going to want her slow, because if she's not slow enough, She's just not going to be able to use her special abilities because they have some pretty massive cooldowns, especially that second special that you're going to want to use. It means the fewer turns she has, the fastest the the faster her specials become available. But 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 here's one weird thing and call me crazy on this one. This is written in a way where it's very conditional if all allies are unaligned and there are no GLs, which means that let's say you don't do that. Let's say you throw in some characters who are aligned, who are Jedi or Sith, or you throw in a GL. Does that mean the cooldown mechanics are shut off? It means there's no more increases going on 
no more decreases go going on. So you have big cooldowns still on those abilities, but you might be able to throw her on another squad and see what happens. Now you're going to lose the mechanics of the leadership, so you're not going to want to do that. It's just interesting to think about, just wondering what's going to happen here. But without the offensive stacking and the stat boost, that's what you're really losing. So don't do that. But, some, but it's fun. So with the attacks, the basic keep fighting, physical damage to the target, all unaligned allies gain tenacity up and accuracy up. So we started with the leadership ability because otherwise this basic might read as a little underwhelming. But with the leadership, there's a big 50% crit damage increase when allies have tenacity up. Combine that with someone like Fulcrum, where the more buffs she has, the more damage she does with Whirlwind, because each buff is an extra instance of damage that's going to have a twofold uh, effect where she has the stacking offense from the leadership ability and she is going to just be using the ability to do the attack to com to inflict that offensive damage the first special force barrier this is a cooldown of five all allies gain 10 percent bonus protection gain an additional five percent bonus protection for each active jedi ally and 10 percent bonus protection for each active unaligned all unaligned allies gain defense up the weakest unaligned gains damage immunity so the damage immunity i would treat as the critical component here with the big cooldown this is an ability about keeping someone alive and making sure they have a chance to recover the other nice part is defense up that buff will be boosting fulcrum even further but it's not a buff i would be relying on think of it as a nice bonus the final ability the second special determined assault a zeta ability with a cooldown of 10 and this was the ability that was called out and compared to rex's aerial advantage physical damage to the target enemy plus bonus damage equal to 10 percent of the target's max health maxing out at 200 percent for each turn an enemy has taken during this encounter. This ability starts on cooldown and can't be evaded. All unaligned users gain defense penetration up and the weakest other light side ally recovers 50% health now with the big cooldown it'll likely happen on its own but the longer you wait the bigger the hit the attack plus healing does double duty and can be timed with a cal's ability and the force barrier damage immunity to quickly take someone at low health and close to being taken out of the battle to near full health and becoming a threat again Cal Kestis is in-game, which gives us an opportunity to break down his gearing. And I like to look at this just to give us an idea of are we dealing with a hard-to-gear character or an easy-to-gear character. Even with gear being easier and cheaper, it's still a little bit of a pain because as we do things faster, it consumes our gear at a higher rate, which can still create some pain points. Now we're going to break this down into the tiers that I like to look at it up to gear 11 then to gear 12, and then to relics. And I like to look at gear 11 because that's the first stage where characters become very usable, and where they become meaningful. I use a lot of gear 11 characters. I'll have something out on the Tuscan soon. And that's the staging ground that I bring my roster to before I start making decisions about who is going to be moving up to relics. And it allows my roster to pivot with the game. So to gear 7... I like to look at the hollow lenses because that has a little redundancy with relics so they can be consumed at a fairly high rate. There's only two here. That's typical. At gear 8, this is fairly easy. We got a Carbanti and another hollow lens paired with a fusion furnace. The fusion furnace, along with what we see here at gear 9, the Nubian, Nubian design tech, those are pieces that your account will grow out of. I'd say around the 7 million GP range. A year ago, I still had to be a little careful with those. Really more the Nubian scanner. The Nubian design tech, maybe the 6 million range. But fusion furnaces, I still had to be careful with. But we got two stun guns here and a stun cuff and one Cairo, one set of Kairos. So that, that would, that's a somewhat standard gear 9. Not terrible, not great. 
at gear 10, two more stun guns, another Cairo set, and an eyeball. That means to get to the gear 11 staging ground, we're dealing with four stun guns, one stun cuff, an extra Carbanti, and an eyeball. And some other pieces of gear, but that aren't really huge pain points. That's pretty easy. The stun guns are a pain, but they're far easier than they've ever been. If you're focused on them, you can do them pretty quickly. And the huge thing is, the only the two Kairos up to gear 11. Most characters these days are three. There's a few at two, and the crazy outliers are at one or higher at four. Now, gear level 11, this 11 to 12 jump, this is easy. There's one extra Cairo, there's an eyeball, a thermal, a stun cuff, but these finishers, it does have the Mark IV comlink. And this was something I was talking about oh, a few videos ago that it seemed like this piece was m more common than it was and or it was just an observation bias and uh, one of the viewers here did some number crunching and it's not really any more common but what I think is what's going on is now that gear is easier we're gearing our rosters faster which is getting us to a point where we are consuming the com links at a faster rate than we did before because we're not we're not being slowed down by carbs and stun guns in the way that we used to. So we're getting to the levels of the com links faster than we used to passively accumulate them. Because before we were getting them at a rate where you weren't really noticing how common they were. This is something that I think about from time to time, partly because the com link is a very common uh, donation request in guilds. But the gear 11 to 12 jump is easy. Gear 12, this is not a problem. He's gonna be an easy character to relic. The first three pieces, the left side gear pieces, these are easy. We got a Nubian scanner, which is a little annoying, but the multi-tool, the tactical data, the visor, those are all fairly easy ones. We don't have to worry about any med packs on the left side pieces. On the right side, we do have one med pack and we do have two fusion furnaces, but that could be far worse. That's fairly manageable and with a little prep, you can handle it. And he does require two of the Cairo prods, which you do need at a higher rate. So that is a little bit more annoying than it is the Cairo computers. Those you need about half the rate as you do the prods. But all in all, this is an easy character to gear. Really, it's the stun guns that are gonna be the pain point. And these days, that's not what it used to be. For today's gearing, this is the gearing I did on January 12th to get myself ready for Java. So this is soon after the release of Zori Bliss. So I'm taking her up to gear 11, because again, that's my staging ground. I like to do testing. You can see some of those old grand arenas where I was using her along with a largely gear 11 fin squad to pretty decent utility. It was a very effective squad and she's been a solid addition to my roster, but more of a 5v5 character, I'd say, than 3v3, which is why you haven't seen her in recent videos. These are pretty important Zetas. I'd say she doesn't really work without them, so I put them on right away. Sometimes I like to do a little AB testing was not the character for it. And now here we're going to look at Java. You can see I had brought up all the characters in stages. Now we're doing the big stuff. So this one might be slightly less of an interesting video because it's a lot of relic stuff going on. We might speed this up even more. We're on a, or we might skip around because uh, I don't think we need to see all of this in action. But we got Luke. C-3PO, all the main characters. But So again, this is just about mid-January, January 12th, where I did this. So you can see that's about the rate that it took me to get to Java with the Bosch, Leia, and uh, Kersantan all being farmed up. Prior to that point, those characters were all released, I think, in like the... September to October range. We farmed them up by December and then just working on the gear uh, after all those Grand Inquisitor projects and the Profundity consuming so much gear 
took me a while to be back in a position where I could then gear up for Java. But in the meantime, and you will see it on the screen again, uh, at, either in the middle here or at the end, you know, we farmed up a lot of the Dr. Afro requirements. So being able to do double duty of working on multiple projects this is why I really love those projects like Afra or Star Killer because it's a much shorter road and you get some very large impacts that can really help counter opponents and I really would recommend going after characters like Afra and Star Killer over getting additional GLs because it's about what is the shortest road to get a big impact on your roster? And that's the shortest road these days. GLs are twice the project of, maybe in some cases, like a Lord Vader, maybe nearly three times the project of those smaller characters. And with Datagrams, like right now, Afra is awesome with the Datagrams. So you can get these temporary boosts, but we'll see. So Greedo, beloved character. I'm looking forward to being able to get some more utility out of him and work on more contracts uh, so that I can get that quest done, the Bounty Hunter quest, because that's the one I'm working on right now is that Greedo one. Also looking forward to those changes where uh, I can finish that Fulcrum quest because I was stopped by the Hoth battle the Rogue Six battle for Fulcrum. And they're going to eliminate that, CG said, I think around the time of the raid, so maybe around May the 4th. Uh, and I'll be able to have another quest completed because I'm one of the, the people who likes that kind of stuff. The thing, like the, the titles, those are... The ones that are pains, there's a, just bragging rights in those. And that's fun. I, I never cared that the rewards with them were of poor quality. Because if the rewards were good, it would be a larger incentive for everyone to get it. And I like certain things having where you have to work for them. The gaffy. Aurora, I, I want more Tuscans. The Tuscans, again, have been awesome for me. Um, I'm going to, I think I'll talk about it in a separate video, but that viable series that I've been working on off and on, just whenever it strikes me, it's, it's always been the most undefined video series of the channel. I think I've finally figured out what I want to do, it. where it's just a lot of these newer marquee characters. If you can use them at Gear 11 or... Uh, Effective counters, that's what I want to be showcasing with uh, these characters. Okay, so now you see me working on Skiff Lando. Yeah, so most of these. We're, we're going to just skip to the end at this point. Let me arrow this stuff. So there's Kersantan. And then here is where they look. And then the main screen here, you can see where the farms are on triple zero and BT1. Actually, you can't, let me, uh, right there. So triple zero, BT1, they're at five stars at mid-January. And Sana is at three stars, but she was on, she was on a cheap note? She was on a note, right? Yeah, she was on the lights. I, I forget if she was Cantina or not. I, but she, I find farm. She was a Cantina, which is why I farmed her so quickly. Like those Cantina farms, you can do in two weeks. Like the the light side, dark side nodes. Those those are like month long farms, month and a half long farms. But yeah, Sana, I just burned through. And Zori just became farmable. So I'm gonna try and finish Zori before these Calcestis requirements happen because what we're going to have pretty soon is just a lot of competing farms. It's going to be hard to stay on top of the refreshes if multiple of these characters end up on light side, dark side nodes or maybe they're going to end up on fleet nodes. So we're going to see where CG 
throw some of these characters. But when we've had, like with the Inquisitors, multiple characters on Light Side, Dark Side knows that does slow down a farm a little bit. And I might be reduced to farming, to doing fewer refreshes, because you can only do like maybe three farms at once on the Light Side, Dark Side notes. We're going to wrap it up there. The Cal Kestis video is going to be right here in the corner and up above is a recent Grand Arena that had a great defense from my opponent. I think most of you have probably checked it out already, but if you haven't checked it out and you want to see a strong 3v3 defense, that guy's got one, and I'm pretty happy about getting through it. But thank you for watching. Be safe out there, everyone, and be excellent to each other. This is Still Plays Galaxy of Heroes.